Lee, what trends have you seen in the screenwriting business in the last five years? Well, it really depends on TV versus film, right? Because in film, we really had a period of going away from original content, um, going more towards IP. So we see the studios going more towards IP-based screenplays. Um, however, this last summer has been a huge game changer because this summer, while it was on par with previous summers so far as box office is, is concerned, it was mostly indies that really were able to prop up the summer box office. Had it not been for indie successes like Bad Mom and some horror films that came in and changed the landscape, we would have been behind about 25% in our annual box office. So that's changing the landscape again so far as what people are looking for in content. We also saw the bubble burst um, as far as the superhero movies. And so we are veering again more towards original content. That's where scripts like Bubbles by Isaac Adamson that was on top of the blacklist at the end of 2015 really gets to shine because it's such an original, unique story, story of Michael Jackson's chimp. Um, and so we are seeing the search for truly original work again and on the film space. On the TV space, we're moving away from procedural, which was really the broadcast network cash cow. Now that we are at about 450 programs, scripted programs per year in the original space, we're seeing a lot more growth in the pay cable and the basic cable and in the digital streamer space. Those lean on serialized narratives a lot more so than procedurals. So we're seeing that skew as well, as well as half hour comedy becoming less funny haha -ha, and a lot more interesting relationship comedy, things like casual, transparent, which is really a, a drama. Um, so we're seeing a lot more exploration of the half hour space in a less traditional networky kind of manner. And do you think that it's all cyclical and then at some point will revert back to sort of these, as you said, network sort of blockbusters? I don't know that we will, ultimately. If we're looking at television, we are in the time of peak TV. Peak TV was expected to max out at about 450 shows. We're now anticipating that this peak will last through 2019 um, and we'll get up to 550 plus. Now, even in that case, networks will, will be responsible for about 150 of those shows. So there's only so many procedurals that will be made. The, bulk of the growth that we're seeing is on the basic cable front, on the pay cable uh, front, and on the digital front. And those are really finding their footing with serialized dramas, with more exploratory content. Um, as far as studios, what we've seen happen in studios as far as the blockbuster goes, the summer blockbuster, the superhero movie, this is something that has been in the works since the mid-90s when most studios were purchased by corporations that put in some brand strategy to develop these big brands and to really build up to box office success. That has now evaporated. What's the next step for the studios? That's for all of us to find out. But it certainly has changed and it will continue to change. What it'll change to is the big question. What are some of your favorite episodes that you've seen come out in terms of the serialized content? Oh gosh, there's so much good serialized content out there. Um, I'm a child of the 80s, so Stranger Things to me was so wonderful. Um, I'm a big fan of everything from The Affair to Broadchurch, which is a British series, Rectify on Sundance, that's about to be done, kind of heartbreaking. Um, you know, I think Breaking Bad is the greatest thing ever created for television, Sons of Anarchy. Um, the list just goes on and on and on. I also love documentary series, so The Jinx, Making a Murderer. I think there's a lot to be learned from those, um, but there's just so much good content right now. I'm catching up on The Crown, which is really fantastic. Um, I, I don't have enough time to view everything that I want and need to view because I have a lot of writers on a lot of these shows. Um, but that's kind of the pleasure of our time, right? That uh, you get sick, you lie in bed for a day, you can start catching up on something you've been wanting to see and it's going to be a highly satisfying and very unique experience. Um, you know, shows like The Night Of, Westworld, everybody loves Netflix and HBO these days. They're doing great, great stuff and it's really inventive and, and developing. You know, we're, we're changing year after year. We're seeing new contents. We're seeing new explorations. We're not rehashing things right now, which is just so exciting. Right, and really pushing the envelope. Oh, yeah. You know, you talk about being a child of the 80s, as I am as well, and, and just nothing was sort of pushed that far yeah. in terms of some of the content and subject matter. And Absolutely, and, and I think that Netflix, specifically Netflix, Amazon, um, as well as FX and some of those smaller homes that 
or tours have found really allowed creators to create 12 episodes to tell their story. So creators really went out and told their story with that much more confidence in the through line as opposed to just trying to sell a pilot, which is the experience on network. You try to sell a pilot, you try to put it into development, you try to have the pilot shot, you try to have the pilot picked up, but you don't really get that through line of 12 episodes right off the bat. Um, so we're really seeing auteurs hit their stride and really take you on a journey that they're not tentative on in any way, shape, or form. And that's really exciting. It seems like, too, the flawed character is the hero now, more so than ever, or maybe I'm wrong? We, we certainly are seeing that, and I think there's a move away from the likable hero to the relatable hero. Um, we, like I said earlier, Breaking Bad is my favorite thing ever, so I find myself talking about it a lot. Walter White wasn't necessarily likable, but he, he was highly relatable. A lot of people in this world feel that they've settled, and it was his quest to be the best version of himself, even if that version is Heisenberg, that really rallied an audience around him. So we are no longer in this place of you have to be Mary Poppins, right? You have to be beloved and darling and flawless, but rather relatable. And I think the relatability um, is what's drawing audiences and where different people are finding different homes. Um, you know, this, this lack of perfection has been refreshing to say the least. For a long time, we were in a place in TV in what we call dark and getting darker. Um, I think that we've moved away from that a little bit. Um, shows like Penny Dreadful, that was a great show, was one of the height of those. Like, how much darker can we go here? We saw that happening and still see it happening in Walking Dead, that's still on the air, and then Fear of the Walking Dead. But I think that we are now moving back into more of a serialized storytelling as opposed to an exploration of, of the depth of darkness. Does the screenwriter really have to live in Los Angeles? It depends. If the screenwriter wants to write for television, the answer, as much as people hate to hear it, is yes. Television is an all-hands-on-deck kind of business, so you really do have to be here. For a writer to get staffed, for a writer to sell a pilot, there's going to be an obscene amount of meetings that precede that. There's an obscene amount of networking. So a writer really does need to be here for television unless they are brought in by their agent, their manager, just to sell a pilot um, and they're able to come in for weeks at a time for meetings. That said, if you want to staff on television, you have to be here. People are not going to take a chance that you'll make the move once you get the job, and they're going to give more consideration to writers who are available to walk into the room in two days. I can tell you most of my writers who've gotten staffed um, for the first time on a show usually got the word five or six days before. Um, it's not one wow. of those things that you know weeks and weeks and months in advance. You hope, you have suspicions, you're told by the showrunner, but you don't have your paperwork in hand until a few days before the room opens. Um, and so you have to be available to not only be in the room when the room opens, but also network executives want to meet with you. It wasn't expected, but here they are. It's now 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning and they want you in at three. And if you can't make it, you don't have the job. So you have to be available for all of those things. I find that showrunners and executive producers are less willing to take a chance on writers that they don't know to be available in that fashion. Now, for film writers, I find the situation is very different. As a film writer, you can be anywhere in the country. The world is a little bit more difficult because we do want you to be available for meetings, be available quickly. Um, so I, I do find that a lot of people are a bit more forgiving as far as geography is concerned for feature writers. The most important thing about living in Los Angeles is that it's a sign of your commitment to this career. Um, I work with a great feature writer who lives in Colorado who met a manager who wanted to sign him and the manager knew that we had worked together and so he called me and he said, how do I know this guy's really serious? He's in Colorado. And so I had to step in and say, no, 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 I promise, I swear, I've read more than one piece, this writer, this is the career, this is what he's doing, it's not a hobby. Um, so the move to Los Angeles is not so much for availability on the film side, even though that is important, so I don't want to discount that, you have opportunities to network and meet, and not only meet executives, but meet your class of writers, but it is an important sign of commitment to this is the thing that I want, it is not a hobby, it is not a thing that might or might not turn out to be. Um, it's something that I'm banking on. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about coming to Los Angeles because this is where movies and television are made. And if this is what you want to be a part of, if you can, 
you should get here. Now, as a mother of two and a wife, I certainly understand that if my life was elsewhere and I wanted to be a writer, maybe moving is not that available to me. Um, if that is indeed the scenario, then the writing has to be that much stronger so that it does get noticed through the surer channels of the big, big contest. So if you're a feature writer, you want to get to semi-finalist in the Nickel Fellowship, not necessarily just the quarter finalist. You want to really have your work surface in a way that it becomes undeniable. And undeniable is a word that you're going to hear me say a lot because it's a big key term for the industry. Work that is undeniable, writers who are undeniable, that's who the industry wants to work with. So let's take a hypothetical and tell me if this might work. Suppose I'm a writer, I live in the Midwest, and I have an, a relative or a friend that has an LA address. And so I'm telling these network executives, oh, I'm in LA, and I'm trying to make it work and squeak by. Can that really happen? Suppose I say, yeah, I live in LA, I can, I can be, what time do you need me there? I take a flight. How realistic is it I'm going to be able to keep that up until I'm hired? It's possible, mm -hmm. not probable. I've, okay. I've gotten calls for my writers by somebody saying, hey, you work with such and such, right? It's Friday, it's 11 o'clock, I want this person in my office at 2. Mm, I want wow. to sign them before the weekend's over, get them over here. And if you say, mm, they can't do it, that becomes a problem. Wow. Um, and also there's an issue of honesty, right? You want to be as honest as possible. Now, I have a good friend who's in Seattle who is a television and feature writer who comes down on a regular basis and takes meetings. I have writers in New York. New York I do find to be an advantageous location because the industry travels to it a lot. So there are opportunity to meet with potentially your agent or your manager when they're visiting New York. Um, you know, you want to be as honest as you can about it while being entirely available. So right. the thing is to say, I'm in Seattle. If you let me know by eight o'clock in the morning, I can be there too. Hmm. Okay, right. So yeah, aside from the honesty part, it, still being able to travel and making it work and being able to oh, yeah. move here if you get the job, it probably yeah. sounds like it wouldn't work. Well, the thing is that writers who are remote to Los Angeles should expect regular trips to Los Angeles at their own expense. Um, initially, before the writer is repped, it's going to be to come out here to potentially attend conferences or classes or events, start to get to know their writing class, then when they, when they are repped, come to meet their reps. Um, and then start going out on general meetings that their rep sets up for them. So, you know, when I have writers coming in from the East Coast, sometimes I don't even get to see them because they're literally booked from Monday morning at 9 o'clock in the morning all the way through to Friday at 5 p.m., sometimes into the weekend with back-to-back -back meetings. And that's something that any writer who's not in Los Angeles should expect to take on should their material hit, and that's really what we want, right? Because the way that a writer breaks today is not quite as linear as write a script, sell the script, get the money. It's write the script, use the script to introduce you to Los Angeles, introduce you to the industry in the context of general meetings. So that's where the writer will get to go out on a lot of generals, meet with a lot of people, and for that you certainly want to be able to do that, do that consistently, sometimes do it every few months. Um, you know, when things get really, really hot, then potentially do it every month. Um, those are the things that a writer needs to be able to deliver on and agents and managers tend to look for those red flags that signal whether or not the writer is going to be available to be in Los Angeles as much as it's going to be required in order for them to get a career off the ground. Okay, another hypothetical and that is someone has a family trip and they're going to come to LA and they want to get a feel of the landscape. They plan to be pitching scripts, they may even come and move out here. What would you say is a good self-tour for them? Well, I always tell writers who come into town from another location, and occasionally I'll have a writer from Australia saying, I want to come to LA with a family or without, uh, but come to Los Angeles, how do I do it best? The way that I usually advise writers to do it is to plan their trip around an event so that they have a natural destination in which they can go, they can meet other writers, they can potentially meet industry people. So whether you are coming for one of the big pitch events that take place in the summer, or you're coming for a conference like the Produced By Conference that puts you face to face with the industry, you wanna plan a visit around that and then look for other networking events that are happening around that. Get to know the landscape that way, um, but have those anchoring events that, that really inform your visit as opposed to show up and go, I'm here, anybody. Um, so yeah, so I like to have visits anchored by events, as many as possible, and then, you know, usually the, the good thing about Los Angeles is that we do have networking events that are happening all the time. So in any given week, you can find ISA, Thursday night 
social, you can go to, that happens once a month. We have Scriptwriters Network that has Friday night drinks. We have Blacklist that puts on events. So Final Draft does. All of these organizations put on networking and socializing events for writers as well as what happens regularly at the WJ Foundation that puts on great panels um, and the list goes on and on. So you really want to anchor your trip with an event and then find networking events around those so that you can start to get to know not only executives that you want to work with, agents and managers you'd like to have rep you, but other writers who are themselves breaking in who may have amassed a little bit more information than you have so fun so far and really help you learn the lay of the land. Okay, so let's take this screenwriter who's arrived in town, maybe they found a networking event on Twitter, eventful, something, and they show up. What are they doing? How are they not being too parasitic and creepy? How are they being not too introverted? What's the right balance? You know, I'm going to take this back to an anecdote. Um, a friend of the family's, um, of mine and my husband's, is a director. And my husband's not in the industry. And this director sat down with us for brunch one day and told my husband how he was going in all these generals. This is a director who's done a big movie for Fox, et cetera, et cetera. And my husband said to him, I, I don't understand. What do you do? You go on all these generals. What do you do? What, what's the point? And he said, my point is to get these people to like me. And that is what networking is all about. It's to get people to connect with you and like you. So it's not about getting to know everybody. It's not about meeting every last person. It's not about giving your business card to every last person. But finding a few people to connect with, to exchange experiences with, to be real, to be interesting. Because the interesting thing about this industry is that it's not just an industry, it's also a lifestyle. People who participate in it, participate in it oftentimes 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So they want to work and help promote and help boost other people that they like. So it is about making those genuine connections with people who potentially will help you along, will give you some information. Potentially in the beginning, they'll only read your script and give you some notes. But then they may get repped and then they may offer to introduce you to their agent, to their manager. So it really is about building relationship. Networking, I think, has gotten a, a bum rap. Um, it, it has the sticky, icky feeling of, you know, I have to sell myself somehow. It's not about that. It's about connecting with people. It's about forging relationships and doing it effortlessly. Usually the best way to network is in the spirit of generosity. What can I do for you? What can I offer you? What may, do I have that could be interesting to you? Forget what you can do for me. So finding those relationships, finding people that you can talk to and potentially whether you offer them, and you don't have to offer everyone to everything always, but whether there's information, life experience that you can share that will inform something that they're writing, that will inform something they're producing, that goes a long way. So it really is about listening a lot, inquiring a lot, um, learning about that other person and building those bonds so that suddenly when that one networking event is over, that person that you just met, met emails you later that night and says, oh, by the way, there's another meetup. It's, people don't really know about it, but if you want to come, had a great time meeting you tonight. Um, so it is about building those bonds and building those relationships. I was talking earlier today to a client of mine who just sold a show, a show to NBC. And this client was speaking of all the people who've come out of the woodwork that she hasn't talked to in 10 or 15 years, who just dropped her an email saying, hey, I heard you sold the show. Would you staff me? Oh, nice. And uh, we talked about <laughs> the fact that nobody would staff somebody they haven't talked to in 15 years or they've only met once. But they would staff or they would at least consider somebody that they know and like. So the fostering of relationships is really what networking is about in this industry. Building and maintaining relationships with people it starts with one or two and it grows from there. Um, it's about having five, six, ten meaningful relationships as opposed to knowing everybody in town and not having them know you back. Yeah, I think we've almost lost the art of that a little bit because it's so easy to look someone up on social media or online, just find out what they do, and then just go right in for the pitch instead of just being human. So it sounds like just still remaining human, mm -hmm. remembering that it's a person there ordering drinks or food or whatever, and you're still in this little bar or wherever it is, an event. Absolutely. And not instead going for the big ask or the big pitch. I prefer, you know, I always tell my clients, I don't want you to ask for anything. If people like you, they will offer. If you ask, even if they say yes, they're likely not going to deliver because they're not invested. But if they like you, they will offer all on their own. You know, agents and managers talk about it a lot, what their networking is like, because they're in breakfast, lunch, dinner, drinks daily. 
nobody likes to be sold to, right? Nobody likes that experience of I'm just selling you something now and then go on to your next meeting and where you'll be sold again. So it is about remembering the details about the other person on the other side of the table and agents and managers will speak to that. They will sit down, they will talk for an hour about how's the wife and how's the kids and what are you doing and are you still hand gliding? Remembering those details and really building those relationships then permits them at the end of that lunch after the hour had passed to say, and by the way, there's this one writer I really want to talk to you about. At that point, there's an exchange that everybody's comfortable with because there's enough of a foundational relationship that allows for that to occur. What a lot of writers forget and what a lot of people forget because of the nervousness that networking inspires is that your job is really to connect. It's to build relationships. You don't build relationships with an ask. You build it with a give. And oftentimes you build it from learning about the other person rather than just informing them about you. What is the screenwriting path to failure? I love that question. Oh, good. Okay. I actually adore that question because I think everybody has this idea of failure, but nobody knows what it is, right? I'm going to fail and it's gonna, I'm going to go down in flames. And you're, No, you're not. The only failure in screenwriting is A, not writing. I wrote a script five years ago. I'm running around with this one script. I haven't touched a typewriter or a computer since then for any creative purposes. That is screenwriting failure, not writing new content, not generating new content, harping on old content, not getting notes. Huge, huge, huge in the failure of, of things. If you are tunnel visioned and this is how it has to be and anything short of this, as I saw it on the page, arrives on the screen, then it will be my failure. You will fail in that because this is, while writing is solitary, this is a highly collaborative industry. So the road to failure is not writing, not writing new material, not getting notes, wanting to be perfect. There is no perfection in this industry. It is all about getting notes, learning from notes, getting notes that you hate, figuring out what to do with them, um, because other people's are, uh, people are gonna have to buy in. So the road to failure is really being stunted. Stinted, stunted, stinted. Um, well, what is, oh, sorry to interrupt you, what, what is being too perfect? Because I think a lot of people that try to be too perfect, they don't realize it. So what is that? Um, it's always thinking that it can be better. And you know, most work can be better, but there is a point of diminishing returns, right? There is a point where you are just switching around your wordsmithing and you're really, the returns are, you improve it by a percent, by half of a percent, that's not going to do it. So when is the work ready? When is it strong enough? When do you believe in your work? And a lot of writers feel very, very confident writing, but not confident at all getting the work out there. So at some point you have to understand, okay, this is what it is. This is what I wanted it to be. I'm a big believer in feedback. So getting f feedback from people that you trust, um, who have some experience and knowledge in the industry, be they other working writers or consultants like Michael Haig or Jen Grisanti that you've talked to, um, or script readers that are known for being really hard on the work, when they say, you know what, it's good, get it out there, at some point you have to let go. At some point you have to say, yeah, I can futz with it forever. And you can, I promise you that you can, and I've seen writers do it, and I've had fights with writers who've done it, who just would harp on the same script. You have to accept it for the potential that it has. You have to question whether or not you've realized that potential. Did you do what you wanted to do with the script? Did you write the story that you wanted to tell? Is it being received in the manner that you wanted it to be received? So are people getting it? Are they connecting with it? Are they enthused by it? If the answers to that is yes, then you get it out there. As much as rejection is part of the job, and it is part of the job, you are going to get rejected, and so you better grow it or develop a tougher skin. You will be rejected, get it out there. The point is to get that yes, and you have to get through a lot of no's to get that yes. But you have to get the, world out, the work out there. It does no good for you on the shelf. It does no good for you sitting on the computer w without anybody seeing it. Of course you want to scrutinize that the work is up to par, right? You, you want to make sure that the work is strong and you're getting the feedback that it's strong enough for people that, who don't have to be nice to you. Um, and that's a really big thing. So it can't just be your friends who are concerned about maintaining a friendship, right. um, who are going to be a little bit more forgiving because they understand your intention. They know what you went for. You didn't quite get there, but they saw it enough. Um, but people who will scrutinize your work and be demanding of it are telling you, it's good, get it out there. Get it out there. That's how you build a career. You don't build a career with one script that you're precious about. 
You build a career writing great script after great script and getting people, getting a fan base that's excited about you, that's excited to read the next thing, that knows that the next thing is coming and want to be the first on the list to get it from you. Well, I think you've talked before about this industry wants to be able to work with people that are easy to work with. Mm -hmm. So if someone's receiving notes, what are some tips that they're resistant, whether it's in their body language, whether it's keywords they're using, and vice versa? showing that they're open you always want to really listen during an out session it's not your time to defend the work it's your time to listen to take the physical notes to jot down thoughts don't defend the work um, you know I've, I've had occasions where writers were given a note and an executive called out something it was a problem and the writers went it's not a problem I don't think it's a problem do you think it's a problem I don't think it's a problem it's not a problem that sort of thing is an obvious giveaway that the writer is not listening. Um, it's listening to the notes, it's listening to the note behind the note. Um, if there is something that truly, truly, truly you think the executive, the person giving you notes didn't get, you can say, well, I tried to illustrate that with this in this particular scene. Was that not clear? You wanna always ask those leading questions to find out where you missed the mark because ultimately the mark was missed. Can we assume that once in a while an executive will miss something? Yeah, and usually they're pretty open to, oh, I didn't realize that this connects to that, maybe we can do that better. Um, it's usually very easy to tell when a writer is resistant to notes, uh, when the writer is instantly defensive, when the writer becomes sarcastic or passive aggressive, um, and there's a lot of passive aggression that can come out in a note session that like, well, I thought da da da, but fine. Um, so, you know, I've, I've seen it in, in note sessions with my writers and I've, and I've given some brutal notes. And there have been people who just sat down and jotted notes and said, okay, let me go back and think about it. And there are people who with every note would say, well, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but fine. Um, so you have those little cues that you know, you know in a minute, body language first, um, dismissal, there can be a judgment of the individual giving notes. Well, you, you're a woman, so naturally you would think that. I've certainly gotten that, that feedback. Um, or any, anything that has to do with your, you're a woman, you're a mother. Um, I've gotten that, well, you're, you're a mother, so clearly you couldn't relate to that. No, I'm, I'm a human being. Um, try, for a writer taking notes, try not to dismiss the note giver. Um, because ultimately all that does is sabotage the relationship. Because what you're saying is, Yes, you took the time, you did the work, you read the script, and now you're giving me your thoughts, but I'm gonna dismiss them. Because suddenly, something about you makes you not good enough to give those notes. You're a mother, you're a woman, you're white, you're black, you're whatever you are, but it's really important not to dismiss the note giver, especially not in front of the note giver, um, so that there can be a dialogue. Oftentimes, a writer can receive a note and be perplexed by the note. But the thing then is to look for the note behind the note. Okay, you gave me a note about X, but does it really have to do with Y? Is this what's bothering you? And you can certainly explore that in a conversation. You want there to be a dialogue and you want to build a kind of trust where the note giver knows that you're listening, you're paying attention, you're taking those notes, so that when you say, you know, there's one thing here that's bumping me, can we talk about that a little bit? That's not defensive, that's thoughtful saying there's the one thing, I, I agree with your list of 20 other notes, totally hear you, we're good, but there's the one thing here and it's bumping me, can we go back to that for a minute? What was it about this character, the scene, this pivot, this escalation that bumped you? What, what was it that felt inauthentic? Was it that, could it be something else? That to me is dialogue and it's differentiating between shutting down the note giver, which can be done physically, just, you know, I'm no longer interested, it can be done verbally, um, or getting into a more collaborative environment, which is what executives want to work with. They don't want the writer to be a yes person. There's a difference between being a yes person and being collaborative. Being collaborative will require some pushback on occasion, and that's okay. But you better be really thoughtful about your pushback. You know, that is somebody that people want to work with. I didn't, you suggested X. I didn't do X because ultimately I thought it would affect the script this way, but the note behind the note implied that Y would work, so I tried that this time. That's being collaborative. That's not being a yes person. 
And the truth of the matter is that a lot of writers think that they're given notes and the executive just wants them to implement the note verbatim. I find that to be very rarely the case. Um, if that was it, the executive would be a writer. Um, you know, they're giving, they're throwing out ideas. They're trying different things and they want you to try them on for size and see whether they work or they not, they don't work. So if there's a note that they gave on a previous draft that you didn't implement, they want you to be able to answer why you didn't implement. They want you to be able to say, well, I tried that and the way that it affected the script was this. And because of that, I realized it didn't work and I took it out, but I did something else to offset your note. Wouldn't they want a yes person? No. Why? Because they want the writer to bring their creative juices to it. That's why they hire a writer with a specific story sensibility, with a particular skill set, with a particular taste level for a particular project, right? They want somebody who will bring their unique sensibilities to the project. Otherwise, hire a typist. Get the script, hire a typist, and have the typist type in whatever needs to be typed in. They want, and of course there are the few executives that are known around town for being really locked into their notes and they want their notes implemented the way they want them implemented and that's it and it's not a conversation. But by and large, I find that the creative execs, executive producers, producers, development execs are all looking for a creative partner as opposed to just somebody to execute on the page. They can get their assistant to execute on the page. They don't need you for that. They would be much better off giving the material to their assistant who has a bachelor's in, in English lit to implement some changes than going back and forth with you. They don't want you to be a yes person. They want you to provide your unique story sensibilities, your unique writerly touch to make their notes, they can be quite shitty, come off sing, singing off the page. How are you softening some of the screenwriters that you're working with, or maybe you're not, that are either too defensive or they're too mamby-pamby of a yes person? Um, it, it is a balancing act. So I think that once writers start getting notes, and a lot of notes, they, they learn. They learn, because you're going to get notes that are outright offensive to you for what you've written. But you learn to take the good with the bad. Um, you, you know, I always tell writers as they prepare for the industry, go find people who will hate your work. Those are the people whose notes you want. You don't want the people who tell you how brilliant you are and how perfect it is. You're not going to learn anything from that. You're going to learn how to take notes from getting notes that are really offensive and finding something in there that you can use. What is the core of that? What is the, what is the little kernel inside that note? that you can take and do something with and really move the material forward with. And listen, I remember this from my days of being a writer, getting notes and just getting infuriated and coming back and going, okay, there was something there. What is that thing that's there? What is the note giver really saying? So you want to really teach writers to take notes, to be receptive to finding that kernel, that truth that is in every note or in most notes. You also want to work with writers in the way that I work with writers is not giving them the answers when they're going, okay, so there's this note and I'm going to execute it that way. Is that good? No. Figure out your way to execute that note. And I get writers coming back to me, there was one note that said this, how do I implement it? You figure it out. You're on your own. I'll sit with you and I'll brainstorm with you once you have the direction, but it has to be your direction. And that's where you have to listen to your inner writer. Right? You have to really foster your talent, your sensibilities. Of course, it has to be malleable. You have to be able to work with other people's sensibilities. But the key to being a great writer is taking other people's ideas and making them your own and falling just as in love with them and being just as invested in them as you would be had the idea, the concept originated with you. Because the reality today is that, you know, 2014, 1800 people, WJ members, made income in the film industry. Roughly 132 scripts sold. What does that mean? That means that over 1,600 people made their money writing pages, doing writing assignments. So how do you become that writer who does writing assignments and does it successfully? You're able to take a kernel of an idea and make it your own and fall in love with it and really take it and run with it in a way that makes other people want to work with you. What do you say to screenwriters that are afraid someone will steal either their idea or their finished script?
this is really so unsexy. Get over it. It's, it really, the, there really is nothing for the industry to gain from stealing work. If you're a brand new writer and you wrote something that is the greatest idea ever, the industry is much better off, you're not a WGA member, buying that script from you for 25 grand, 30 grand, maybe 50 grand and doing whatever they want to with it, as opposed to potentially getting tied up in lawsuits. It really doesn't pay anybody to steal work in the industry. And you can't come at the industry from a place of mistrust. You can't come at agents and managers saying, well, I'll send you my work, but I'm really nervous because I've heard about how scripts get stolen because then you're coming at it from a place of, I automatically do not trust you, the industry. I'm the writer. You're going to victimize me. Nobody wants to work with that. Nobody wants to deal with that. And the reality is that when Bridesmaids came out, I can't tell you how many writers came to me and said, oh my God, I wrote that exact same script. There are ideas that are zeitgeisty. There are ideas that are in the moment. Um, and those ideas tend to manifest in many different places. But it really does not serve you in any way to think that the industry will steal your work. Your job with your script that you have, if you're writing outside of the industry, in all likelihood, if you have a feature script, the job of that feature script is to get you an agent, to get you a manager. That's its job. It likely won't sell as it is to the industry. We're in an industry, the 2016, we are likely to sell less than 100 specs. That's not a big number. If you're aiming for that bullseye, that is a narrow, narrow, narrow bullseye. You want to use that script to get you an agent, to get you a manager, to introduce you to the industry, to get on the prestige list. That's what you want that script to do for you. And in order to do that, you have to expose the work. So get over any idea that somebody will steal your script because that's just not going to happen. And in the rare, 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 rare occasions that it has, the writer usually got their, their own success in their own way. Well, let's continue with mistrust because I think on your screenwriting blog for your website, leejessup.com, you have a post entitled Screenwriters Leave Your Mistrust at the Door. Mm -hmm. And I know some of us are way more trusting than others. Some are maybe more on the naive scale. But you talked about some, some things that a lot of people I think would be afraid of. Like they want me to sign a release form. I mean, that's scary. That's, that, that's a little scary. Or um, I think this one we're kind of touching on, that screenplay has the same concept of mine. Somebody stole my idea. Wouldn't they rather cheat me than pay me? So how do you work with someone that's already coming with those set of fears and make them so that they're a little more workable, um, but not naive, not, not a doormat? I always tell my writers that I'm the safe, the safe space. So you can let out all your neuroses and I'll put you in your place. So I actually wrote that particular blog post after a writer of mine um, had finished a script. The script had, made, had, had been entered into one contest, hadn't placed, um, and another script with eerie similarities sold. Eerie, eerie, eerie similarities. And the writer came to me and said, what am I to make of this? And we had to kind of sit back and say, okay, here's where the script was. Here's the writer who just sold a script. Here's, there is no, as much as I understand their eerie similarities, let's talk through what the probability would be of this writer, an established writer with a summer blockbuster, would have of stealing your script. Let's talk through it. So I always tell my writers, I'm a safe space. We need to talk about it. But at some point, a writer either wises up or not. So I worked with a writer for a while that I no longer work with who refused to pitch any ideas, talk log lines, or anything as such in a public environment. So in a coffee shop, in a bar, which is where a lot of industry meetings take place, mind you. The writer refused to do it because somebody would listen and somebody would steal his, steal his idea. And it became uncomfortable. And so at some point I had to say to the writer, listen, you're going to have managers meeting you. There was a manager that wanted to meet with that writer in a coffee shop. So the manager is going to ask you, what else do you have? What are you going to say? I can't tell you here. I'll send you an email. It doesn't work that way. So at some point, even if you have it innately, you have to set it aside. You have to, because this industry works the way that it does with the idea of trust and respecting the creative mind, the creative brain, the originator of content. If you originated a great idea, a great script, a great story, why would I steal it from you? Why wouldn't I just take the thing that's already done and do something with it? Wouldn't that make more sense for me if I'm a producer or an executive? 
Why would I steal it, get somebody else to write it, potentially for more money because they are already well known, either they execute it well or they don't, maybe they don't, or somebody else does the same thing before my script is done. Why wouldn't I just pick it up from you? The creator of content who came up with this great concept, what incentive do I, an executive, have to steal it from you? And that's what a lot of writers have to, despite how frustrating it can get, have to look at. And that's ultimately what that writer and myself had to look at when a script with eerie similarities to his sold. There was no way for the manager who sold that script to get that script. There was no way that an industry executive had read that script. It had been submitted to one place three months before. There was just no, no reality in which the script was stolen, rewritten. What the writer had to acknowledge was that ultimately, if I'm the manager, right, behind the script sale, and I, here I got, let's, let's assume, I got a completed script that is great that I think I can sell, and I have this writer who just had a box office success. What is the, my best way of making the most money? My best way of making the most money is getting the one script that I just got that's ready to sell and selling it and booking my writer who just had a big box office success on a writing assignment and making more money. Why limit the ways in which I'm making money by having the writer then take the script and try to make money off of it rather than monetize both? So those are the equations that writers have to look at. Is it really in the industry's best interest to steal content? I really don't find that it is. I think this is another blog post of yours, but I wanted to expand on it. Sure. So writers are great at, at explaining in someone else's story, but what about their own, especially when it comes to presenting themselves mm -hmm. to the world, to the studio system? What is that refining of their own story? What is too much? How truthful do they be? You want a writer to be truthful when they talk about themselves, but you have to also remember that a writer's first story is their own. So if they don't know how to tell their story, it's going to be tough to trust them with other stories. So you really have to figure out where is the juice in your story. It's never in chronology, or very rarely in chronology. If you travel to space, sure, chronology is just fine. Um, but it is about finding a way to connect your human experience, for lack of better words, to the person who's sitting across from you, to become interesting, to become unique, to tell them a story they haven't heard that is truthful in yours and it can be completely anecdotal. Um, you know, I've certainly talked to people who start out saying, I have, I've never done anything interesting in my life. Well, then what's your point of view on the things that you've done? What have you made of your experiences? Um, to find those stories that really speak to who you are as a person and a writer. Um, to tell something interesting and unique so that a month later, a month after a general with an executive, be it in a production company or a studio, that executive looks at a piece of work and says, hey, what happened to the writer who? The writer who had that experience I can bring into this one. Um, you know, so it is about sharing those experiences, those points of view, um, and finding a way to tell that personal story that is meaningful and that is connective and that isn't tied up in a bow. It doesn't have to be pretty. It has to be memorable and eloquent. You have to be comfortable talking about it. So it can't turn into a therapy session. Um, you know, but it has to be that story that nobody else has to tell. So you know, for a while, everybody was talking about writers who would go into networks and talk about how television was their only friend. We've heard a lot of those stories, so those stories are no longer unique. Every writer, every person has an experience, has a point of view that is uniquely theirs. You don't have to take half an hour to, to tell it. In fact, we want it told in two minutes, in three minutes, the most but relate to us something that we can remember that speaks to who you are, because that's who we want to work with. You know, I have a writer who is super talented, lovely, lovely woman, very, very shy, who came to me and said, I don't know what my personal story is and I can't really talk about it. And so I had her bring in a lot of anecdotes. And there were a lot of different stories and they all came out kind of sad. And the problem was that she's a comedy writer. Until one day she brought me a story about her mother. She's Korean, she grew up naturally with a Korean mother who was obsessed with not wrinkling her face. So she taught herself how to laugh without moving any of the muscles on her face so that she would never age. And so she, told, she taught my client to do the same thing. Fast forward 20 years, my client is a comedy writer. What does that tell you? 
Of course, she told it with a little bit more flair and detail. But those are the kind of stories that stick, that are unique, that are memorable, that nobody else has. Those are the stories that you want to share with the industry because they'll remember you that way. Okay, so if someone's envisioning their story and how they may explain it, first off, how will they or in what arena will they be telling this story? Like, when would it ever come up to say, hey, you know what, Lee, tell me about yourself. I've seen what you've written, but I want to know your deal. In every general meeting, an executive will sit you down and literally say, so, tell me about yourself. Just like that. Um, we talked earlier, I, I was doing a lot of interviews for this book that I'd just written, and in that environment, I'd gone in to meet with agents, managers, executives I've never met with before. I can't tell you how many times Folks that I was interviewing would sit down with me and say, so Lee, tell me about yourself. Those are the moments that it's asked and it's in every general. It's in every opportunity. Who are you? Is there anything for us to connect on? Is it the story that you tell? Is it the way that you tell that story? Is it the sensibility with which you see the world? So it's in every general meeting, every last general meeting. Tell me about yourself. Other than what else do you have? It's perhaps the most popular question in this industry. Lee, where would someone actually be telling their story and how deep do they go? How light do they keep it? Can I envision the scenario as to how someone's going to be asking about me? Sure. Um, oftentimes it's going to happen in a general meeting. It, niceties, bottle of water, tell me about yourself. Can I get you something to drink? Tell me about yourself. It's very blunt and upfront and do your show. Um, you know, I have writers who have different versions of their stories. Um, so I have one writer who suffered a traumatic event in her childhood. And if she is meeting with somebody that she feels an in instant bond and trust with, mm -hmm. then she will go deeper. She will go darker. With others, she will leave the nitty gritty out. So you tailor your story a little bit to see what in how dark you want to go where. But the rule is never make it a therapy session. Never. Bring in a story that you're not ready to talk about openly without breaking down, without having a moment of tears. All of that is unnecessary because a lot of, specifically in TV, TV really looks at what do you bring into the room, right? It's not just what your writing is, but what personal experience, what themes speak to you? What, what do you bring with you into the writer's room? So they want to know that you're capable of talking about whatever it is you're bringing comfortably that it's not going to be a therapy session, that there's not going to be suddenly an elephant in the room that makes everybody uncomfortable. So you want to have those layers to the story. Comedy writers tend to really look for the lighter, fluffier, happier stuff or the really dark stuff told in a very funny way, uh, you know, tragedy via comedy. Um, but drama writers tend to have those more layered stories that they choose how deeply to go into. Um, you know, so if it's being abandoned by your father, is it, you know, the life of petty crime you're forced into at 12 and how cute you were getting away with it? Or was it the nights that you spent alone and when you didn't have money to pay for electricity and what that felt like and what it felt like when social services showed up and tried to uproot you from your home? Those are different ways to tell the same story. Um, so writers really do pick and choose and it's important that you assess your environment to really determine which version of which story you're telling. Um, ultimately, it's always going to be the same story because you're going to get known for that story and then there'll be other anecdotes that will come along with it. Um, but it really is about finding that core story and taking it out there and getting the industry to know you through it. Okay, so different versions. Yeah. Maybe have an A, B, and C version. Yeah, you have, you know, you have the kind of deep version where you, where you really kind of drill into the story and then you have your more for lack of better words, shallow version of it that is less confrontational, less demanding of the listener, less uncomfortable potentially. Um, it really is how you look at it. Some, some writers prefer to not expose any sort of wound when they talk about a personal story. They're perfectly happy to stay surfacy and, and just allude to a wound, but it really is about planning it and rehearsing it and exploring it so that when you go into a room, that's not when you're excavating your own story and figuring out what's, what works. Lee, I've finished my screenplay. Very excited about it. I'm ready to get it out there. What am I supposed to do? So it's going to be different for repped writers and unrepped writers. Vaguely the same steps, but different mechanics, if you will. Um, for a repped writer, you, 
the one, the one kind of step that will happen for both a rept writer and an unrept writer is that you want to really vet the work. So you want to get people looking at it, whether it's writers in your writers group who are all working writers, whether it's a consultant that you pay a fee to or a reader, you want to really make sure that in my world, I don't want a rep to see a script that hasn't been vetted. I'm just not comfortable with it. Um, so you really want to vet it, make sure that it's holding up, that enough people are having the right response to it, as opposed to saying, well, it's a pass for me, but here's what worked about it. If it's a pass for them across the board, it's a problem. So you want to really vet it, make sure that it's holding up, that it's really strong. Um, now, if you're a rep writer, let's say you're looking for new representation. You're going to give it to your other writer friends. You're going to give it to agents and managers that you've met previously see how they respond to the work. If you're an unrepped writer, you're gonna give it to your circle of friends, see if any of them gets inspired by it. You're not asking them for an introduction, you're asking them for a read. You can also go out and build pedigree for it, which means you're going to answer the question, why should I read the script? So how do you answer that? You answer it with some element that certifies your script as ready for the industry. That can be the blacklist, the website, that can be Spec Scout, which is another website. It can be a big contest. All of those are filtering services that are in place for the industry to filter through thousands and thousands of screenplays that are registered on a regular basis. But how do you find the great scripts among them? That's where contest comes in. That's where television writing fellowships come in, screenwriting labs come in, um, and websites like The Blacklist that are able to provide evaluations and rank the script. Um, so you try to build some pedigree, specifically if you're an unknown writer, in order to answer the question, why should I read the script? I have 120 scripts sitting in my queue. You just queried me about one I've never heard of. Why in the world should I read it? Because it's good, it's just not good enough. So having the ability to say, well, this was a nickel semifinalist, or this got an eight on the blacklist, or I was just a finalist for the ABC Disney Fellowship. All of those things are the reasons why one should read the script. In addition to that, once you have a little bit of pedigree as an unknown writer, you want to start getting the work out there. So you want to get it out to your friends who can potentially help you get the work to agents, managers. You want to pitch the work. So whether you want to participate in live pitch events that happen in Los Angeles and Austin, also a little bit in London, or do online pitching that Stage 32 and Roadmap Writers provide year round, you want to start talking about the work and getting it out there. That is your job. Your job is to get rejection, you're rejected. If you don't get enough rejections, you're not doing your job. If you're afraid of that, no, stop being afraid. Um, but really your job is to use that script to build relationships for yourself. Yes, you want to enter it into contests because if you're not able to get any interest pitching the material in six months time, if you're able to place well in a contest, it will give your script second wind. Um, I have one writer who was just a finalist in Austin. I was a finalist for Final Draft, was a finalist for Page. Um, he had written a script that his agent ultimately didn't respond to at all, put the script into a bunch of contests, placed well in all those contests. Now there's suddenly interest from management. Other people want to talk to him about it. He's not writing for an audience of one. He's no longer just writing for an agent to say yay or nay. Um, so you want to take that script and use it to build inroads to opportunity. Okay, let's suppose I put it out there, either I'm repped or unrepped, and there's no heat on it. Then you have to take a look and say, okay, where, where is the problem? Sometimes the script just will not get hit the heat that it requires because who knows? Um, you look at something like Nick Yarbrough's um, A Letter from Rosemary Kennedy that was a semi-finalist in the nickel and then nothing. And then it went on the, the Blacklist website and was a featured screenplay and nothing until somebody discovered it. Now the writer is with WME, Emma Stone is attached to the material to star. Um, you know, at some point you have to have conviction in your work. One of the managers that I love working with is a guy by the name of Jewel Ross. And one of the reasons that I love working with him is because once I asked him, I love him for many different reasons, but once I asked him, if you send a script to 50 people and everybody passes, what do you do? And he said, I find the next 50 people. And you have to have that level of conviction in your work. If you, the work is vetted, if you know that it's being received as intended. So if people in the know have read the work and said, yeah, it's great. It's really great. I love it. You have to fight for it. Um, and listen, there's some great scripts that you fight for that nothing happens with. And then that, that other script that you think will never be as good at is the, is 
the one that hits, but you have to fight for the work. You have to believe in the work. Nobody's going to believe in it more than you. And yeah, some scripts will come up short. We don't know why. We don't have the perfect explanation. You know, I have a writer who wrote a great feature. This is a repped writer. Um, wrote a great, great, great feature script, very dark, um, that had to do with police violence. And ultimately, then Dallas happened. And so everybody looked at the writer and said, yeah, really good script. Congratulations. Not going to do anything with it. Those things happen, and that's OK. Um, but you have to fight for the script as much as you can, unless there is some sort of impediment that's stopping it from proceeding forward like that. Meanwhile, while you're fighting for the script, you better be writing your next one. So that if it does open that door and people say, great, I read it, love your writing, what else do you have? You have that thing to give. But you have to fight for every script. You have to pitch it. Because if you don't believe it in it enough to pitch it, to fight for it, to invest in it, why should anybody else? Continuing on with fighting for the work. Suppose you're working with someone, they've come to you, and you either have someone who's very sort of uh, self-deprecating, almost mouse-like, or someone who's more of an overconfident braggart. Either one's probably detrimental to yes. getting their work out. Yes. So what are your rules for sort of either breaking down the braggart, or maybe you're not, or boosting up the mouse? Well, with, with the mouse, I just talked to one such mouse this morning, um, who takes every failure, every no, as, as a testament to her own lifelong predestined failure. And so I have very hard, brutal conversations about the fact that there, there will be a lot of rejection, there will be a lot of no's at every level. At every level of this industry, nothing is ever perfect. Nothing's ever just handed to you. And so it's important to me to have a lot of candid conversations about learning not to take the no's with quite as much weight. Uh, because if you do, it's just never ending, right? It's, it's just a recipe for disaster. Um, so we talk a lot about conviction in the work, believing in your work, believing in your potential, not needing to rely on other people for your own self-worth, because really that's what it boils down to. Um, and so we talk about that a lot and we talk about fattening up people's lives. Um, so making sure that my writers who are mousy um, have their sources, their dependable sources of fun. That it's not all about the writing all the time, because the other side of it is if it's just the writing, if it's all about the writing all the time and nothing else, eventually they'll have nothing else to invest in the writing itself. They'll have nothing to bring to the writing. So it's really kind of filling out their lives and making sure that, that they're fulfilled on many different levels. And it's not just the writing that defines them. Because if it's only the writing that defines you, A, you will become a very boring writer, and B, it will never be fulfilling enough, ever. And I've seen that a million times. Hemingway committed suicide. You know, the, there's something to learn there. Um, and so the ones who are tend to be a little bit more braggy, um, tend to be a little bit more egotistical, um, a, li a bit more full of themselves, will talk a lot about how their behavior is coming off. And I will do a lot of meeting prep with them and talk about, you know, the way that you're talking about that to me, comes off a certain way, and you may want to pay attention to these things. That's why I'm here. I'm here to reflect that and be a mirror to those things. Um, and so we'll certainly talk about how those things come off and that we can't afford that. Um, nobody wants to work with somebody who is just completely full of themselves. I had recently a conversation with a manager about a, a client of mine that he represents and he says, you know, I, th I think this client is just couldn't care less about my opinion. And I said, well, actually, I think it's quite the contrary. I think that he's desperate to impress you. And I think because of that, he may be coming off a little bit bigger and more boastful, but it's out of desperation to get you on his side, to get you to rally behind him. It's not for lack of respect. It's because of respect that he's behaving that way. So many times writers don't have me as a go-between. Um, to communicate to their agent or their managers or the executive that they're working with. So a lot of it is me talking to them about, listen, this is how I'm reading you right now. I know it doesn't sound fun, and I'm sorry to say this, and I love you, and I know what a great person you are, but this is how I'm reading this. Is this how you want me to read this? Because if you're fine with it, keep going. But I'm reading your behavior as that of one who is smarter than anybody else in the room. Nobody wants to work with that.
Can I hear some examples? Let's suppose conversations with the self-deprecating writer, conversations with the braggart, because maybe this person doesn't recognize who they are. Um, a bragger, the most obvious and overt ones are the braggers that will come in and say, and these are usually not professional writers because professional writers don't do this and have learned better and have broken because they don't, but it has happened. This is the greatest script you're ever going to read. That's a big statement. I'm the Michael Jordan of screenwriting. Whoa, hold on. I've had, these are things that have been said to me for the record. You know, this, this is the script you've been waiting for. Take the script, somebody told me once, take the script on vacation. This is my vacation gift to you. Oh, how kind. Read it. I want you to sit at sunset and read it on the veranda because this will make your vacation. Great. Um, so those things have been said to me. Um, you know, you want to steer clear of this is the greatest, this is the best script ever. You can certainly say this is the greatest thing I've ever written. I'm really proud of it. I've worked really hard at it. You know, I have eight scripts behind me and this is my best one. That's not bra braggery. That is genuine. But somebody coming in and saying, oh my God, this is so much better than anything else out there. I had one writer, working writer, no longer working writer, um, who used to be very, very successful, had fallen from grace a bit, not a great deal, um, but who used to every year write a list of all the screenplays that were nominated for Academy Awards and then write arguments for why, why his script was better and send it out in Christmas cards. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Not a good idea. <laughs> Just not a good idea. If you're saying to me that your script that's unproduced, that nobody wanted to pick up, that has been read by everybody but nobody loved it, is better than Argo, you're, hmm, it's a problem. Um, so that's, you know, that's the braggery side. And, and of course the examples I brought in are, are a little bit on the extre extreme side of it, but I think you get the tone of it. Um, you know, the, the, most, the more self-defeating defeating writers, it usually is conversation about I got this rejection. I know that I will never be the person I want to be. There's usually a direct connection about what rejection means about the person, not about the script or the person reading the script. I, I'm not going to make it as a writer. I will never be happy. I will never be fulfilled. I'm just a loser. I didn't make it in this contest. I can't tell you the rhyme or re a reason of screenwriting contests. I've been in this industry forever and I still don't understand them. And I have writers saying, oh, I, I didn't make the quarterfinals in the nickel. I'm a loser. I know that I'm a loser now. I'm a bad writer. Hold on. There's going to be lots more rejections. There's going to be lots more opportunities to be a loser. Don't jump at the chance so quickly. But for a lot of writers, it's very real. And don't get me wrong. Every writer has a moment or 15 of being self-defeatist. You know, I have one writer who's a working writer who always says that if you're not thinking about quitting at least twice a week, you're doing something wrong. And I believe him. I, th I think it's very, very true. I think every writer thinks they're failing at a moment. Every writer thinks that they're not good enough. Every writer thinks that they're never going to be able to recreate the past success that they've had. I think that's perfectly part of the deal. But seeing everything as a failure as an indication that you are just a loser or you are just a bad writer or you are just a bad person. That is what I see in the more self-defeated defeated writers. And the problem is that nobody wants to work with that. Nobody wants to be in a room with that. Nobody wants to pick up your script as a validation to who you are as a human being. They want to pick up your script because it's a great script. And they want to bring you into the room because they think you have something to contribute. Not because they think that you need the room. And that's, that's a big distinction. So are you giving these people pep talks or that's not really what your job is about? Oh, I give people pep talks. I'm, I'm Israeli. I'm married to a New Yorker. So there's a lot of tough love in the picture. Um, you know, admittedly, I get a lot of tears from a lot of people and I want to be the safe space to that and the place for writers to voice frustrations. And I certainly try to support them through it. You know, there are writers where if I see that we're getting to a place where every time we meet, it's just horrible and the writer is in pieces, I will ask, why in the world are you doing this? It's more important to be happy than to be a writer. 
What are you doing? Um, so I will, I will have those conversations. There are pep talks, there is tough love, um, and there is a shoulder to give. I recognize that this is a really, really hard profession. You know, I was talking to a writer this morning who was really frustrated with a set of notes that she had, was given and implemented on a pilot that she just sold. But the draft that she turned in, she wasn't delighted with. And it took a toll on her because she really wants to do the best at everything. And it brought her to question, why am I doing this? And this is not her first time to the rodeo. And, you know, should I really keep going? Because this happens every time. And I said to her, you know what? The day you sold this pilot, you called me on the drive home after the pilot sold in the room. And you told me that this is one of the happiest days of your life. Now you're having a bad day. This is not one of the worst days of your life. And because of that, you're gonna keep going. And that's the truth of the matter. We're all gonna have bad days here and I'm here to support my writers through them. But it's about understanding when there are some bad days and when it's all bad days. Lee, I think you've said that feature writers should have a new ready to market feature script every six months or so, and that TV writers should have a new original pilot every like three to four months. In a perfect world, okay. yes. Okay. Is that um, a lot of pressure though? It is a lot of pressure. I find that most features go six to 12 months. You know, the truth of the matter is if you take 14 months and you come out with a great sample, I'm not going to hold it against you. Um, you know, the, the important thing for me is that you keep writing and you keep finishing work. Uh, for pilots in a perfect world, I would like to see two generated in a year. Um, sometimes it happens that it's only one. Sometimes it happens that it's three. It really depends on the writer. So there isn't one set course that you're supposed to follow, but it really is about doing the work and then getting the work out there. Sometimes you'll work on a script and you'll say, you know, I've worked on this for eight months. I've tackled it every which way. It's not happening. So it's also knowing when to let something go, not for all eternity, but potentially to come back to it later when you've had a stroke of genius that informs you how to take the work, how to make it better. Um, you know, but the point with having those broad goals is to just do the work and get it out there rather than spend years and years and years tinkering with one screenplay that then you're at the risk of after three years, and I just went through this with a writer, tinkering with the same script for three years and then going, oh, it's not good enough. It'll never be good enough. I'm not going to get it out there. And then starting another script and spending another two years on something and then going, oh, but it's still not good enough. I'm not going to get this out there. That is the challenge that we run into that. So because of that, you really want to expose the work early and often. So that means from concept, you want to run the concept by people in the know, whether they're members of your writer's group or in a class or whatever it is have people look at your outline. Like really don't be afraid to expose the work, to get feedback, to have questions asked. I was just sitting with a writer of mine who had written a script, a feature script, um, with the guidance of his manager. Um, and they had been on the script for a year and a half. And then he gave the script to a few writer friends. And he got some massive notes back. And what he said to me is, Ugh, if only we'd given it out on outline, which is what we all were pushing him to do. But he felt loyal to the manager. He didn't want to expose it. And I understand, I understand the choice that he made. It was in, in a tough spot. Do you listen? Do you serve the one master? Or do you open yourself up? I generally prefer to expose work early and often because I think it just saves you a lot of time in the end. Is someone writing for themselves or for the industry? That's a good question. Somebody is writing the stories that they love, that they are passionate about. I don't believe in writing to the market because ultimately you'll always be behind. Um, you know, what you're writing now, if you're writing with what's, you know, whatever is happening in the industry right now, in six months it's going to be dated. So I think writing to the industry can be a losing battle. Um, while you should write with an awareness of your audience, who your audience is, whether it's television or film, who would watch this show, where does the show belong, what season does this film get released, is this a summer blockbuster, is this an end of year movie, is this a February movie, is it going to be a movie for 16 to 24 year olds or is it going to be a movie for 49 year olds and older, what are we talking about, you should be aware of all of those things, but you shouldn't write to them. I think the moment that you try to engineer your work towards something, it loses its brilliance. I know somebody, a manager who for a long time was working with his girlfriend to engineer a script for the blacklist, for the list, the blacklist. Ultimately that script was never finished. 
because it was engineered. And, and the manager then came back and said to me, yeah, we, we tried to engineer it, clearly a bad idea. Um, so you have, to, you have to listen to your heart song in that sense. You have to really write the original exciting material that is uniquely yours, that, that is the story that you're dying to tell with some awareness of how the market will and won't receive it. So if you want to write a script that is going to be full of singing and speaking eels, it's likely going to be a challenge. Uh, but if you have to do it, do it. Um, but write it in a way that is true for you. Write, write the story that you want to tell in a way that is exciting to you, but that can be digested by the market that it's for. Lee, can you share some stories of writers that were unrepped that went to then become repped and worked in television? Of course. Um, there's too many good stories there is the problem. Um, but one of my favorite stories that, that is a story, something that happened to a client of mine this past year. Um, this is a client, um, a writer whom I met through UCLA. Um, we started working together. He then started taking classes at a program called Script Anatomy that I'm a big fan of. Um, really perfected his work wrote a fantastic pilot that ended up actually coming um, in second place in the prestigious UCLA contest. Um, using this pilot, he found a manager who decided to shop the pilot, which is highly unlikely today to shop a pilot from a brand new writer. Um, but he found a manager, a very well-known and well-respected manager, um, who took out the script. They went on a bunch of meetings and a bunch of networks. Ultimately, at that point, nothing had come, come of it, um, but he continued to network pretty aggressively and in a pretty focused fashion. He is Latino and he went to a panel of Latino writers and had prepped for the panel before it had happened. Um, and so he walked in knowing a little bit about each one of the panelists. He tried to communicate with three of the four um, those three he couldn't really make any sort of connection with, but the fourth writer he really hit it off with. Um, ultimately, he felt like he didn't want to stalk the writer. He didn't want to be the guy going, can you read my script? Um, so he befriended him on Facebook and Twitter and that was the end of it. A few months passed and he realized that this writer was teaching a class at WritingPad, um, which is a writing program. Um, and said, you know, I'm going, it's, it's a prep class for the television fellowships. I want to go sign up for the class because as part of this class, this writer is going to have to read my work. The writer read his work, called him up and said, hey, I think I know of an opportunity for you. It turned out the opportunity was staffing on American Crime Season 3, the most prestigious show on network television. Based on the writer's personal story, the writer went on to meet with the executive producer of the show and then went on to have a call with John Ridley. Um, he had no in-the-room experience. He was then called in to meet with ABC Disney's inclusion department, which subsidizes the fellowship. Um, they all signed off on him. And three days before the room opened, he got the call that he is staffing on the show. Um, I, I really love this story because I feel like it takes the onus of getting that first job out of the agent or manager's hand. The writer is now signed with CAA, um, writing feverishly, seeing him tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning, um, you know, hard at work. He, he just finished his season of American Crime where he had a co-write, so he had a, he had a co-written by credit on his own episode. Um, you know, just as euphoric as can be, love the experience. But it's a writer who really made it happen for himself rather than saying, okay, I have an agent, I have a manager, I'm going to sit on my hands and wait uh, for something like that to happen. So I particularly love that story um, because it, it just shows you what a writer who is smart about networking can do for himself. Um, and, you know, he went from a complete unknown taking classes in UCLA to a repped and working writer. So that's interesting because I think a lot of people that are signed are going to feel like they're, that's where their work stops in terms of them having a search. So can you dispel that myth? Suppose oh, someone's signed by one of the bigger agencies and they feel like, okay, now I've arrived, but really not. The interesting thing is that most writers who get repped, right, even in the bigger, on the, the kind of bigger landscape with a bigger agency, CAA, WME, UTA, ICM. If they truly stop and ask their agent and manager or, or their agent, 
so are you going to get me a job? Most of them are going to tell them, getting you your first job is not my responsibility. That is the truth of the matter. So writers have to continue to network to get themselves out there. So for example, I had a writer who was, won the UCLA contest on both the feature or the, the TV, original TV pilot and spec front, as you do, um, got an, a manager through that, then went on and got into two fellowships in one year, got a manager and an agent, ultimately got her job through her fellowship, but her management was instrumental in introducing her to her showrunner who then paid for her out of pocket, which is pretty non-standard when it comes to the, the writing programs that are supposed to subsidize some of these staff writer roles. Um, so I find that writers, when writers get repped, especially with a manager, but it's also true with an agent, there's always ongoing work, whether it's networking, whether it's doing showrunner meetings, not getting the job, and then getting the, the you know, the, the all, the, the gift that is the freelance, the freelance script on the TV season. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done by the writer. It's rarely just sit on your hands. I have a writer who um, was in a showrunner meeting today. I don't know how it went yet. Um, who is always out there, who's always networking, who is at every event, who is on a board with the WGA, who is on a board with the PGA, who is just always out there working for himself and getting himself out there. And yes, his agents at WME are carrying part of the load, but he is doing a fair share of the work. Now, the important thing to remember is that your agents and your managers, they're collecting 10%. Getting a writer his first job is not 10% of the work. It's gonna take a lot more than that. Because of that, writers have to always be vigilant about getting out there and working their contacts and communicating with their people and getting to know showrunners and doing everything that they can, if not to get the job, then to inspire their reps to work even harder for them. Okay, so now I'm repped, now what? Where does the real work begin? Now, now the pressure's on. Now the real pressure is on. Because ultimately, you got repped on a script, you got repped on a contest win or a fellowship placement. Now it's about continuing to impress your rep. It's no longer about the one script that will get you th that one person's attention. Now it's about staying front of mind for your rep. So it's continuing to generate work, not taking too much time between scripts, but making sure the scripts are up to standards. It's about continuing to network, calling into your agent's office and saying, I just met with yada yada, can you send them the script? It's about, you know, I have a writer who just got signed, got two months ago. Um, and she is constantly, she's a master networker. She is constantly out there meeting with people and calling her manager and saying, I just met with this person who wants me to work on that idea. Please, please pick it up and run with it. Um, so it's working even harder, working with, a greater sensitivity to your manager, your agent's sensibilities, what they will or won't get out there. It's about showing them your hunger, not, not in words, but in actions. Um, it's about managing your communication. It's about understanding that until you've begun to work, they're working for you for free. So you better be nice about it. It's, uh, it's really not the time to puff up your, out your chest. Um, you know, but really respecting the relationship and respecting what they are doing for you, oftentimes for free, for a long period of time, while continuing to impress them. You want them to continue to bet on you. And for that, you have to hit the bullseye every time. So the writing has to be that much stronger. You have to deliver. You have to be great in meetings. They have to get calls from their friends, the executive, saying, April was just in here. Oh my God, I loved her. She is so great. I want to develop something with her. Keep me in mind for her next script. You have to impress. You have to impress at every turn. And you know, oftentimes most writers, by the time they get picked up for representation, have the capacity to do that because they've interfaced with enough writers. They've met the industry. They've worked on their personal story. They want to be collaborative. They want that push and they understand that this is a hard industry to crack, but once you do, it's, it's really great, it's really fun. Um, and so they're willing to put in the work. But the work only gets more demanding. I don't know that harder is the right work, word, but more, more demanding as you go along, as you get an agent, as you get a manager, as you meet executives, as you impress executives, as you build your fan base that wants to read the next thing and the, the next thing. You always have to get better, you have to get stronger. 
Does the screenwriter find themselves an agent or does the work find them the agent? In a perfect world, the way that we'd love to see it work is your script comes in as a finalist for the nickel. Every manager and agent in town reaches out to you, boom, you have a manager or an agent, right? You win the UCLA contest, very much the same scenario, Austin Film Festival. That is not always the scenario. The scenario for most writers is that they're going to work pretty hard to find the rep. It's usually going to be manager first because managers really today serve as talent scouts for the big agencies. Um, and it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of diligence, and a lot of consistency to find that rep. So for example, one of my writers who just got signed a, a couple of months ago had this list of the managers and agents that she would approach every time she would finish a script. And it was vetted and she knew it was ready to go. She had placed top three in final draft some years ago, but nothing materialized rep-wise. And so she had finished a new script that she was really excited about. And we were sitting across from one another and going through her list. And she said, ugh, do I have to send a script to this manager again? I've sent him like five scripts and he doesn't like anything. And I said, yeah, you send it to everybody. That's just what we do. And three weeks later, that manager became her manager, who's now sending her out on an extreme amount of generals and showrunner meetings. Um, because finally, the thing came aboard that he felt, OK, I knew you were a writer. I knew you were good. I know that you're consistent. Now you wrote something great. Um, so oftentimes, it ends up being the writer finding the rep rather than the rep finding the writer. Um, even though we'd like to think that in a perfect world, a, you know, a rep would come knocking on your door. In truth, it's a referral business, so the best reps and the best relationships are forged through referrals, where somebody will say, hey, my friend Joe just finished this great script, you should read it. Um, because really, that's what the industry trusts. We're, we're a highly social industry. Um, so if you can get those referrals, which is why you foster relationships, those are priceless. Um, it's much easier to get a rep through a referral than it is through a contest placement, unless you're winning that contest. Um, or through the blacklist, unless you get the coveted nine rating on the blacklist. Um, so really, it's about working those relationships so that those referrals will be in place when you have that script that's ready to share. Let's talk about inconsistency for creatives versus the people that maybe they're so on the nose and so precise, but maybe they've lost some of the creative flair. I happen to see a lot of people that are inconsistent be incredibly creative and actually have brilliant ideas, they just don't follow up on them. Yeah. And then on the flip side, the ones that actually do follow up, sometimes the creativity or the flair still needs to be flushed out. So how do you nurture both types? Well, you really have to look at writing as a job rather than a muse. Right? It's um, Larry Karaszewski and Scott Alexander talk about, they, they wrote um, People versus O.J. Simpson and Larry Flint and, and a whole bunch of biopics and biodramas, and they talk about this is a job, and we go into work even when we don't feel it. And some days the writing is great, and some days it's horrible, but it's the work. Sometimes you have to write through a lot of horrible pages to get to some good pages, and I'm a big believer in that. Um, you know, sometimes you have to try something different. Um, you know, so it's staying agile and open to the different ways to access creativity. Uh, sometimes it's rejecting creativity and just going for inspiration and through inspiration getting back to creativity. But you have to accept that what works on one script will likely not work on the next. And so you always, always, always have new tricks to try in your writing, new ways to access the work, new methodology to follow, new things that will inspire you. You know, and if, if nothing else, then, you know, you go and do something for fun. Uh, because fun begets motivation. Um, so whether your fun is dancing or hiking or jogging on the beach or whatever it is, you usually come back pumped up and excited. Um, that said, you know, creativity is tough to always channel. So a lot of my writers rely on meditation, on regular workouts, on tracking systems to set their expectations for what they're going to create and when. Um, you know, a lot of self journals, a lot of goals and targeting. Um, so that at some point your, your system begins to understand that you have to show up whether you feel like it or not. What are those tracking systems? That's really interesting. Um, there's something called self-journal that a lot of my clients use that is a planner, um, a task-driven planner uh, with short-term goals and long-term goals. A lot of writers rely on systems like Pomodoro, 
um, that requires 25 minute sessions. Um, so it really varies, depends on the writer. Um, but every writer finds their path. So some writers write for page count, some writers write for hour count. Um, you have to find what is your comfortable space to write three pages at a time or six pages at a time or three hours at a time. What can you meet? What can you meet consistently? Because it's kind of like going to the gym. First few days are going to be really, really hard, especially when you haven't been in a little while. On day 12, 13, 14, you're going to hit your stride. And if you keep going, then you're going to be fine. Um, and it's the same with writing. You just have, have to keep doing it in order to get comfortable with it. Um, the beginning is always going to feel rusty and clunky. By the end, you're going to be hitting your stride. Lee, you mentioned earlier some planning and tracking software. I'm wondering in terms of uh, screenwriting programs, can it really teach someone to be a better writer? No. Um, you know, truly writing is inspiration. Writing is a craft. If you get a hammer, it's not going to teach you how to be a better carpenter. It may make the crea creation of carpentry easier. It's not going to teach you how to be a better writer. Um, you know, it is a craft. It's a craft that has to be practiced. Um, sure, there are tools like Dramatica to help you, et cetera, et cetera, and Save the Cat and all of those. Um, but, you know, I've seen writers take on Save the Cat and not get screenwriting to save their lives. Um, it's not paint by numbers. And, you know, if you're colorblind, painting by numbers is really not going to work for you. And that's pretty much the equation. So I think that all of those things have their uses. And I think that they can be very important guides. Um, for the mechanics of your work, but you, the writer, are going to have to master the craft. I'm a big believer in Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. Um, you shouldn't be shy of getting those. Um, you know, for most writers, the first script is not going to be the script. The second script is not going to be the script. You're going to have to really get better at your craft, and there's no shortcutting that. Even if you filled out the, you know, 40 beats of Save the Cat perfectly, that does not mean a perfect script, ever. Right. Let's take Malcolm Gladwell's The Outlier mm -hmm. in terms of environment fostering genius or genius already being in someone but environment either hindering it or getting it out there. Have you seen that? Where? Oh, certainly. Um, Listen, there has to be a kernel of genius there. You can be a technically proficient writer, but if you're not able to invest some soul in your work, if you're not able to really get feel the way that, that it sings, then it, it will always feel mechanical. You know, I had a girlfriend growing up who really, really wanted to be a great pianist. She never felt it. So her playing was entirely proficient, but entirely cold. And the same thing happens with screenplays. There has to be some, whether we want to call it genius or anything else, talent, something innate that you're able to invest in the work that makes it uniquely your own, or else it just becomes a perfectly technically executed screenplay, but not a great screenplay. And I do believe that that's the difference between good and great. It's that extra thing. And certainly environment can nurture or destroy it. Um, but I've seen, I can tell you sadly, that I've seen writers come to screenwriting and really, really, really want to get it, but they don't. And you try it every different way. I was, I was speaking recently to a friend who's a UCLA instructor who said, you know, I always, I always believe that anybody can be taught how to write. And then once in a while, somebody walks into my class and reminds me that, no, that's just not the case. There are some things that either you understand them innately or you don't. I think most people that come to this come with some innate understanding of screenwriting with the flow of screenwriting, um, with the general structure, the general rhythm of screenwriting. Um, but I think you certainly want an environment to nurture it, to promote it, and to help you rise to your very best. Criticism makes our best work? Absolutely. Listen, I, I believe in kind criticism, so I don't believe in cruelty for the sake of cruelty. But I don't believe that we learn much from compliments. I think they can certainly boost our ego and make us feel good, but the learning happens from criticism, or the learning happens from where we can improve what we can do better. That's how we grow. While, you know, flattery and compliments feel great, we're not going to walk out a better writer tomorrow because of what we learned from the compliment. 
we're going to perhaps be more self-assured in what we did originally well, which is great, and I'm not discounting that. But criticism is what teaches us and challenges us to become our best. What was the internal dialogue that you had when you decided that screenwriting for you, sitting down, writing a script, maybe wasn't what you wanted to do, but you wanted to coach people, you wanted to bring out their best? For me, it was really in the development process when I realized what a foolish child I was thinking that you can write a script and then fast forward six or nine or 12 months and see it brought to the screen and being on set while watching your vision come to life. Um, I understood that I came to it from a very naive point of view, uh, from a fantasy-based point of view that wasn't the reality of, what it, of how movies get made and what the writer's experience is. And I ultimately realized that that wasn't the experience that I, wasn't, I wanted to have or the experience that would make me happy or fulfilled in my day-to-day -day life. And I was lucky enough to have discovered that at a fairly young age, at the age of 23, um, to say, whoa, that, no, not for me. I'm not enjoying this. This is nothing about this is exciting or motivating for me. Um, that said, I always loved story and I always loved writers. So from there, I went to development and really realized my heart was with the writer. The writers were my people, um, more so than the directors that I never really got or the actors that I dated but never really got. Um, <laughs> So my heart was with the writers, and so I wanted to foster talent. I wanted to support writers, and it's funny because today if I watch a tennis game and somebody wins, the person wins and goes out and you know jumps up and down, they're so excited. The person I identify with is not the tennis player. The person I identify with is the coach that you get like one second of um, who's just so proud and, so, and feels so rewarded for what their player had done. And that's, for me, that's the most fulfilling experience. Being able to help others and being in a position where somebody comes to me and says, I need help. I think that's a highly privileged position to be asked to provide help in, a, in an area in which I can help. Have you seen people that have the notion, whether it's to be a great pianist or to be a great writer, but in terms of the day-to-day -day actions that they're going to undergo, it's actually not what they're suited for? Oh, absolutely. And, and what, what are those, what is that temperament and what is it, just it's being alone, it's being self-driven, task-oriented? It's not just that. I know a lot of writers, and these I'll put in quotation marks, who talk about writing all the time who talk about what they want to write and how much they want to be a writer and how much they want to be in a room and how much, but never make time for the writing itself. Mm -hmm. So to me, those, those are the writers that will usually bring me a con to the conversation of, do you really want to write? Because you're talking about it all the time, but you're not actually doing it. And if you are a writer who is not writing, then what are you in terms of this career? You have to have the discipline, you have to have the desire, you have to have the drive, and you have to be willing to make the sacrifices that most writers do that it takes in order to become a writer. And that means waking up in the morning early if you have a day job, sorry, um, or writing on the weekends or writing after hours rather than running around partying with your friends. There's a lot of, for mo most writers, most writers are not independently wealthy, right? They're not going to be able to sit around all day and take four hours a day to write and then go party and then go run around and then go travel the world. So most writers are going to find themselves in a situation where they have to have a day job. Potentially they have a family, they have a partner, they have friends, they have relationships they want to maintain. And so writing is going to demand some level of sacrifice. I had a writer that I had worked with for a number of years who we would meet every three or four months. And every three or four months, she would sit down and tell me the list of excuses for why she didn't write the previous three or four months. So the job was too hard and she had to work out because she wasn't healthy and she wasn't sleeping well and she had to move apartments and she was fostering dogs. And there was always something. Um, and she, I truly believe that she wanted, she believed she wanted to be a writer. But at the end of the day, if you're not engaging in the thing, Right? whether it's writing or playing piano or any one of the things, you cannot claim the thing as your own. You have to engage in it in some consistency. And you know, similarly, I meet writers who wrote a screenplay 10 years ago and haven't touched it since. 
but they're a writer. But you have to actively engage in the thing if you want to be taken seriously as an owner of the thing. Lee, let's talk about writing partnerships. Sure. And is it like finding a good roommate? Is it nothing like that? No, it's like buying a house together and committing to living in it for the rest of your life. Hmm, okay. Um, writing partnerships are mostly tragic. They mostly end in divorce. Um, you know, I do work with a couple of partnerships that have been consistent through the years um, that have been successful, but it's two writing partnerships that have lasted from the dozens that I've seen break up over the years, some of which were quite successful together. Um, so if you choose to participate in a writing partnership, you have to really understand what it means to you, to your body of work. Um, effectively, the moment that you are, that you hit with a script written partnership with another person, everything else that will be expected of you will be expected in cooperation and partnership with this other person. Because you and this other person have been able to create the secret sauce that made a great script, that birthed a beautiful child, if you will. Um, and so when you consider writing partnerships, you really want to consider what it means for your body of work. Are you willing to discard your previous body of work or not do anything with it should you hit in a partnership? Um, are you really willing to write more than one project with that writing partner? Um, because an agent or a manager is going to take on the partnership, not an individual writer. Oftentimes they're not going to want to get involved in the drama of a partnership breaking up. That can be very unattractive. I have a writing, a TV writing partnership that just broke up that the agent told the two writers who broke up, either I take both of you on individually or I take neither one of you on individually. So even broken up, the writers both had to make sure the other impressed in order to keep the agent for both of them or else they both lose because the agent just didn't want to get involved in the politics. She didn't want to have to choose. Um, so you really have to consider whether you and the writing partner want to write the same sort of material if you have the same vision. So if one wants to write film and the other wants to write TV and that's all you want to write, that's going to be a problem. The times that you can really vacillate in and out of a partnership is if you're writing together on television but you're writing alone in film. Then you have a little bit more wiggle room but in general I find that reps want to either rep the team or the individuals, not both. Um, it's the same with producers, sorry, um, who want to work with a team who brought them a, pr a beautiful previous project. Um, you know, so you really have to consider what the partnership is, what the partners bring into the partnership. So you really want to think about how does the, the partnership balance out? Are we good with the distribution of work? Are we going to be good for the next 10 years? Because if one writer is doing the heavy lifting and the other is, t is just giving notes, are you going to feel okay about it in five years when your writing partner is collecting 50% of your money just for giving notes? Um, are you, do you have a common vision for what it is you want to write in 10 years in terms of genre, in terms of the space you want to be in? All of those things have to be thought through. You certainly want to get the terms of the partnership on paper. Um, you know, because the truth of the matter is most, most partnerships do go south. Well, I'm thinking of what I like to call the two Steves, Wozniak and Jobs. So you look at, if it was two Steve Jobs, it wouldn't have worked. But because they both had these different skill sets, it worked. Yeah. And so two writers have almost got to be polar opposites, don't you think, for it to work? They have to complement one another. They have to supplement where the other is weaker. They have to bring the best out of each other. They have to push each other. They have to be able to fight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly you don't want two writers who do the exact same thing together. Right. Because then is the partnership the sum of its parts or is it less than that? Um, you know, so you want writers who complement one another, one another where the other is weak. Right, right. Interesting. Do you think people really know that when they first no. meet someone? No. Um, a lot of writers that I find tend to look to writing partnerships because they don't want to write alone anymore, because it's just comforting to have somebody waiting for pages on the other side of things, um, because they're finding that, that it's getting tougher and tougher for them to push a script through, so why don't I do it with a writing partner? Um, I find that most writers go to partnerships that way without taking a step back and saying, am I really ready to step into a creative marriage here? Some of them do, most of them don't. Um, you know, I've, I've had 
partnerships who sold multi-million dollar scripts and then broke up um, because the relationship was so difficult. Why at that point? Because the writers can't stand each other at that point, because they hate each other, because they couldn't think less of each other's creative talents, um, because it was never... It was never a positive relationship to start with, potentially. You know, I had one, one relationship where, that had a feature film get greenlit, where the two writers just could not get along. One was incredibly abusive and, and condescending and kept insisting that he was doing all of the work when the other was really doing the brunt of the work. Um, just didn't want to go through that again. Um, so I've seen write, writing partnerships break up with a lot to lose. And I think it's not for nothing. Like I said, I've also seen writing partnerships succeed, but I think it's where the partnerships come together with a point of view of doing this together for the long haul as opposed to let's try it out. Really thinking about it um, as a long-term relationship as opposed to we'll test the waters and then consider. What about choosing an agent or manager? I mean, it's great to have one of the big powerhouses want to rep you, but how do you know if that person's really for you? The same temperament, the same... The truth is that you never know. Um, you know, there's a lot of selling that happens with, when agents and managers court talent. Um, but you certainly want to query your agent and manager verbally when you meet with them. Um, what is it that they do? Do they believe in general meetings? Do they not believe in general meetings? Are they going to get you their, your first staffing gig? Do they not believe in it? Do they want you to do fellowships? What do they want you to do? What are they going to do for you? Um, do they give notes? Do they not give notes? Do they sign off on log lines? Do they just want you to write blindly and either they like it or they don't? Um, so you really want to ask those questions, um, not in a disrespectful manner, but just to understand what this particular rep is willing to do for you. With, with managers, the, bigger the biggest question is, do you develop? Do you not develop? Those are two different approaches to management. Um, do you, are you for agents? Are you not for agents? Are you going to help me with staffing? Are you not? Those are things that you want to understand so that you don't get an agent or a manager and then six months later go, wait, you're not going to help me get my first TV job? Wait, you don't develop? And I'm just going to keep writing scripts and either you love them or nothing happens to them. They go back on the shelf. So those are things that you really want to inquire about with the people that you're meeting with just to understand the dynamic of the relationship. Is it advisable to try to switch agents within the same house of representation? It's rarely promoted or allowed. Um, you know, the, usually agents will move clients as opposed to clients will fire one agent for another. So, for example, I had an, um, a client at CAA whose lit agent went to talent, so she was assigned another agent um, within the agency because the agency didn't want to lose her. Um, but it's considered fairly difficult to change agencies or agents within an agency without burning some, some relationships. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I do see happen is, say you are with a big agent in a big agency and they're just much too busy servicing their big clients, that's when you can come in and say, listen, I know you're really busy servicing J.J. Abrams. Is there any way that I can be assigned a junior agent for the day-to-day? Um, to potentially bring somebody else onto the team um, to help you out in just submissions, getting you out there, uh, be it for assignments, for staffing, anything like that. Um, that's when you can have team growth as opposed to just be changing hands. Lee, what do writers need to know about writing for television? A lot. Um, writing for television, um, it's a corporate job, really, in a lot of ways. It is a morning to night regular in-office job. Granted, every office is different. So you're going to have some rooms where you're in the room for 40 some odd weeks. You're gonna have some rooms that convene for three weeks after which writers go off to write their own episodes. Um, it works differently with every show. Some shows, writers from staff writers will end up on set producing their own episode and others they won't. It, but it is similar to a corporate structure in that you rise up in the levels from year to year. Um, if you are writing consistently, doing a good job, you're expected to see bumps from year to year. So staff writer to story editor, story editor to executive story editor, on and on and on. Um, they say that television is significantly harder to break into, but easier to create a consistent income in. 
so easier to make a living in on an ongoing basis. Uh, film, on the other hand, is easier to break into. Um, you know, but t television really is all about character, theme, and world. It really is about exploring those and examining those in an ongoing basis. Film tends to be more plot-driven, um, but things like pitching in the room, being able to present ideas in the room, being able to politic properly within a room in order to promote yourself, all of that comes into play in the world of television. Um, it's highly competitive, therefore highly social. Um, you really have to keep your showrunner relationship, your executive producer relationship, and your relationship with the network if you're working in a network environment um, fresh and fostered. Um, it's really a 365 day a year job. It doesn't have the freedom of film um, where you really are kind of sent off to do your rewrites, even on assignment. Um, you are constantly working in harmony with others. Um, and it's a world where people easily lose their job, get new jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's a demanding world. It's a growing world. We're seeing, you know, roughly 4,100 WJ members collect income from television per year. And I'm not talking about residuals. Um, it's also a high reward kind of world because as you rise in the ranks, you will get more and more and more financial reward. Um, and it is a world where you can build a living, right? You can buy a house and assume that in five years you'll, unless you really mess up in some grotesque way, you will be able to maintain a living. That said, I've seen writers mess up in grotesque ways in TV and continue to work. Once you're in, you're able to sustain a career. It's very tough to break into. There are two paths that are seen as kind of the, the more sure bets to break in in a world where nothing is certain. So those paths are the television writing programs that are offered by the networks, um, as well as a few additional organizations such as Humanitas, Sundance, HBO, um, CAPE, NHMC, those kind of writing programs that foster new talent. Um, that's one way to break in. Another way is to go the assistant route. Um, so become a showrunner's assistant, become a writer's assistant, even start as a PA in the room. That said, there are other ways to breaking in. The web has been very helpful. We're seeing people like Issa Rae um, really make their mark transitioning from the web to television. I've known writers to um, write web series and from that get staffed. Um, it's highly competitive, but the majority of WGA sanctioned jobs are in television today. Um, and it's a growing industry. What is shrinking is the size of the room. Um, so as we go into more basic cable and digital rooms, we're seeing those rooms get smaller. So I have writers in network rooms where I have 18 writers in a room. You're not going to see that on an Amazon show, on a Netflix show, on a Hulu show. You're going to see significantly smaller rooms that are very auteur driven. Um, but certainly it is a growing industry where everybody's looking for great new voices. Let's talk about finding the culture of that room and respecting the culture and being able to fit in. The culture is different with every room. So, you know, I had this year I had one writer in one room that opened at 11, closed at 3, was open for three weeks and was done. The writers had lunch together, everybody got along, it was a bit of a kumbaya. Um, you know, I've had writers in rooms that you know, it was pure tyranny. Um, where the showrunner ruled the room with a heavy hand, um, where there was a lot of persecution of the writers who didn't fit in. And that's where I think it's very similar to corporate structure. You can have great corporate environment and you can have a poor corporate environment. Um, but it really is about learning your place in that room. So if you're coming in as a staff writer, learning when to pitch, when to sit back, when to support, when to shut up, um, what to get involved in, what not to get involved with. So of course you have lists of no-nos. Um, you know, you don't want to step on somebody else's pitches. You don't want to write a dead pitch. You don't want to engage in office gossip. You don't want to write anything about the room on, on Twitter ever, if, especially if it's negative. Um, so you have those things that are the, the kind of codes of conduct. That said, every room is different. So I've seen writers get away in some things in some rooms where in another room, forget about it. Um, you know, but it really is for new writers, it is about finding your place, being able to be useful, being able to not melt into the background um, and really contribute to the room from day one because it's a kind of job where you have to perform from the first day. There is no learning curve. You don't have the time to ramp up.
Well, it sounds like also too, you have to make it work within oh, yeah. the room with those. I mean, sometimes you're going to be there, what, 15 hours a day with people? Absolutely. Um, you know, comedy rooms tend to go longer just because things are funnier at midnight than they are at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but you do have to make it work or else you'll be cut with the first cuts. You know, nobody is picked up for a full, full season for television. So usually you'll get a first contract with a back number of weeks, right? So 10 weeks with a back 10, 20 weeks with a back 20. And then the show will have the right to exercise your option to bring you back for that extra set of 20 weeks, extra set of nine weeks, whatever it is. Um, and that will be dependent on whether or not they feel that you are a value. Um, they may decide not to exercise your option and just let you go. They may opt to not exercise your option and replace you. Um, so you have to be useful at every step of the way. Um, you have to be productive. You have to help others and prop others up if you want to keep that job. Um, it's in some rooms you get your episodes and you just focus on that. When you don't have your episode, you're done. You sit and wait for your episode assignment. In other rooms, you're going to be at the board um, or you're going to be helping out when the writer who's assigned to an episode is at the board. You're going to board an episode, you're going to break an episode together, you're going to help research. Um, so you really have to make yourself indispensable to that room. What's the fine line between pleasing the showrunner but not stepping on the toes or threatening the other writers in the room? That's where the politicking comes in, right? Because you want to find your upper level allies, right? Whether it's your showrunner or the co-EP that's usually the number two in the room. You want to have those allies who are rooting for you, who are fostering you, um, but you want to remain friendly with everybody else. Um, so you really have to make sure to not be boastful, um, to not be arrogant, to be grateful for whatever it is that you have, whatever, whatever responsibility you are given, to take input from others at every jun juncture, at every moment, at every step of the way. Um, because that will continue to ingratiate you with the other writers that you ultimately have to rely on. And in every room there is that moment where somebody can be thrown under the bus and you just don't want it to be you. So you have to remain in good favor with as many people in the room as you can. Okay, so let's take the situation of you are thrown under the bus. How do you keep your character in good standing and not let anger come through but still fairly defend yourself? Or maybe there's not a way to do that? Um, it's a tough thing to do and that's why you want to have allies in upper levels who will stand up for you because if you're a staffy who's thrown under the bus, there's only so much you can do for yourself. Um, if you're able to continue to impress your showrunner and your number two, there will likely be somebody coming to your rescue if there's any decency in the room. And that's why you want to maintain those channels of communication. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is you want to avoid being the person thrown under the bus to start with, and that's why you want to foster those relationships on a regular basis while not throwing anybody else under the bus. Um, because once you're under the bus, it's very, very tough to get up from under in that show. You may be able to resurrect on another show, um, and it's very, very much possible on TV as an industry where you fail up, which is a great luxury. Um, but once you're thrown under the bus, it's a little late. Um, so you really want to proactively instill the relationships, really fortify the relationships that will put you in a situation that if you're thrown under the bus and fired, everybody will come in and apologize to you. And that does happen. <laughs>